Hello friends, uh, today we are going to do the current affairs for uh, the 6th of April 2022. Now some of the topics, uh, okay, I'm sorry, um, 6th of April 2022, let that be 2022. Okay. Now uh, some of the topics that we will discuss today is the status of uh, denotified tribes. Who are these denotified tribes? They are people who are uh, criminals or who are labeled as criminals under the Britishers and this was actually they were denotified as those criminal tribes after the British rule but however the stigma that they face uh, continues to remain. Also we will discuss in detail the Sutlej Yamuna link canal and we shall discuss in detail the procurement of crops in India and why they are procured, what are the factors that are taken while the procurement of crops uh, uh, and we will also discuss the electrolysis of water in order to produce uh, hydrogen splitting up of water into H2 okay now the other topics are uh, pretty static okay now what are denotified tribes denotified tribes are all those people who are notified as criminal tribes during the British rule and they were later denotified like what I said after independence in 1952 they have been known as denotified tribes based on the report of Anantasayanam Ayyengar okay so those tribes that were actually known as the criminal tribes during the British, they were later denotified after uh, independence and they were known as denotified tribes as according to the Ananta Sahinam Iyengar uh, report in 1950. There are also many nomadic tribes who are a part of this denotified tribes. One thing to remember is that these denotified tribes, they were not discriminated like the scheduled castes. Okay, they were not treated like scheduled castes. They didn't have any historical discrimination. Rather, they were only discriminated under the Britishers because of the crimes that they used to commit. Okay, now, however, even though they were not uh, historically discriminated, but the stigma that they face is huge. And they have actually been outcast by societies because the Britishers had created that image about them. And many of these denotified tribes, though some of them fall under scheduled caste and some of them fall under scheduled tribes, many of them don't get any sort of reservation. Uh, you can actually read what is given over here. The denotified all tribes, also known as Vimukta Jati, are originally listed as criminal tribes. And they were uh, addicted to the commission of non bailable offenses like robbery, like decoity and all of that. Once a tribe became notified, as criminal, all its members were required to register with the local magistrate, failing which they would be charged with a crime under the Indian Penal Code. A standing committee of parliament in its report has criticized the functioning of the development of denotified and nomadic and semi-nomadic tribes. This is the reason why it is in the news, that the development program has not been according to what needs to be uh, happening. Now we have uh, discussed what the denotified tribes are, you know those tribes which were labeled under the criminal tribes act of 1871 and they were they are very vulnerable and deprived okay the renke commission please remember this is the second commission that we are talking about after ananta sainam ayyengar committee estimated that the population is around 10.7 crores even in 2001 so they are a huge number now what are the issues that they face see they don't have any constitutional support Okay, like how uh, the National Commission for Scheduled Castes exists or the National Commission for Scheduled Tribes exists and also the concept of reservations uh, and also the safeguards that the uh, constitution provides under Article 71, uh, uh, 17, I'm sorry. So these tribes don't have any of them because they escape the attention of the constitution makers and thus got deprived of the constitutional support. There is no categorization. You cannot say that, okay, all these particular uh, groups of people are denotified uh, tribe people. You know, some of them are categorized under SC, some of them are under ST. There is no separate grouping for them. Okay. Like what I said, around 269 denotified communities are not covered under any reserved category. The money spent on them in 2021-22 under the scheme for economic empowerment of the de denotified communities was very minimalistic. There was no money, sh money that was spent under this particular scheme in 2021-22. And even the budgetary allocation when it comes to denotified tribes has been reduced to 50 crores from 5, uh, sorry has been reduced to 28 crores from 50 crores. 
Also, there are issues with the functioning of the development and the welfare board for denotified nomadic and semi-nomadic communities. There is no permanent commission for these com- communities, which means that sometimes in 2003 there was a commission. Okay, later in 2014 there was another commission. So there is no permanent commission that exists that can go into the safeguards of these communities and they can check if these uh, schemes that have been introduced are actually working for their economic empowerment or not, or if any of the budgetary elements is going to the required people or not. Now, how, how and why are they not focused upon? They are not focused upon because they don't have any individual identity. Like the scheduled castes and the scheduled tribes, they don't have an identity. Okay, and these communities are largely politically quiet. They lack vocal leadership and also lack the patronage of a nation leader. There is a lack of education and they have small and scattered numbers. Now, this is one of the reasons why elections and parties and politics is important so that all people can get sufficient representation and they can ensure sufficient development for themselves if they don't have any reserve uh, if they don't have any representation then automatically you know no one will listen to their voice okay they lack even basic infrastructure amenities facilities like drinking water shelter sanitation facilities are not available to these denotified communities healthcare education are also not available and also since they have the stigma of the past, since they were arrested under the Criminal Tribes Act, uh, till today there is a huge stigma around these people and the police automatically catch these people and they are tortured by the local administration and the police often. And they are also on the move uh, frequently because they are nomadic tribes, like what I said, some most of them are nomadic and since they are on the move permanently, they lack social security. And they don't have ration cards, Aadhaar cards, you know, and they don't get any benefits under the governments, or either under the central government or under the state government. And also I said caste related identity is not there. So because of this, there is a problem. Okay, now moving on. Sattla Jamuna link canal controversy. You can see from when this has been happening, it has been happening from 1966 and still we have not been able to solve this issue from the reorganization of Punjab it has been going on and the last latest 2018 it was still in the news why is it again in the news because the Haryana assembly has passed a resolution seeking the completion of the Sattla Jamuna link canal the canal once completed with reliable sharing of the waters of the rivers of Ravi and BS so please know that rivers Ravi and BS they flow only in Punjab, okay, they originate in say Himachal. You know, I, I'm sure uh, uh, Bias originates in uh, the Rohtang Pass, okay. Bias originates in the Rohtang Pass, and Ravi, I believe, uh, it originates in the uh, Baralacha Pass or somewhere around that place. Uh, so, the problem is that Bias and Ravi don't. Specifically, they don't flow into Haryana itself, okay? Uh, And since they don't flow into Haryana, it uh, becomes necessary to bring them through a link canal. That is why it is called Satlaj Yamuna link canal. Because Yamuna flows uh, to the border of Haryana. And you can link Satlaj and Yamuna with the link canal so that waters from these rivers can be brought there. Okay. Now, why should it be done? Because Haryana was a part of the unified state of Pepsu. Okay, Patiala and Eastern, I don't uh, recollect uh, the full expansion of this. So, they were a part of this uh, Pepsu province. And since they were split from this province, Haryana also deserves a particular portion of the river water. The creation of Haryana from the old Punjab in 1966 threw up the problem of giving Haryana its share of river waters. Punjab was opposed to sharing of waters of the river, uh, rivers Ravi and Bias with Haryana, citing riparian principles and saying that these did not flow through Haryana, so why should we give water to it? However, the centre in 1976 issued a notification allocating Haryana 3.5 million acre feet out of undivided Punjab 7.2, so nearly half. And later on, after that, we had a tribunal. We had a tribunal called as the Balakrishna Eradi Tribunal, 
which was set up to reassess the availability and sharing of water because uh, this initial sharing was not taken well by Punjab and it led to Khalistani movement and uh, further there were several tribunals but the most important one was Bal Krishna Iradi Tribunal and the tribunal in 1987 recommended an increase in the share of Punjab to 5 million acre feet and 3.83 for Haryana both of them had increased now let's talk about the status of the canal what is the current status like what I said Satlaj uh, Ravi and BS, they do not flow through Punjab currently. So what we need to do is we need to construct this link canal. A tripartite agreement was also negotiated between Punjab, Haryana and Rajasthan so that the feud will reduce a little. Okay. Now, sharing of water became one of the issues for Khalistani movement. Hence the union also got involved and proposed the link canal involving Delhi and Rajasthan. In 1985, after the Rajiv Longoval Accord that accepted the construction of the canal, there was a tribunal, Balakrishna Arati Tribunal, that published its award in 1987. And uh, the share of Punjab was actually, it was increased a little, but on the whole, as compared to Rajasthan, Rajasthan also got a major chunk of the water. And, uh, you know, Delhi also got a major chunk, a chunk of the water. So, on the whole, the proportion of Punjab had reduced and that's why it was still not accepted and it became very controversial that it was not even published in the Gazette. However, in 1990, the construction started off because the accord was signed, okay? And it neared about 90% of completion, but it was uh, stopped because the Khalistani militants fired against some senior engineers. Haryana had actually completed its share of construction of the link canal and it had given you know, advanced to Punjab for its completion as well. But in 2004, Punjab Assembly passed a resolution terminating all previous agreements with all the states. And this was opposed by Haryana. And it was referred to the Supreme Court under the advisory jurisdiction by the center, by the president. The Supreme Court held that the action of Punjab was unilateral and unconstitutional. This 2004 action, the verdict came out in 2016. But since elections were coming up, all the parties, they took a very, you know, strict stand, extreme stand. And they said that, okay, still we are not going to go ahead with the construction of the link at all. Now, in 2016, again, the government of Punjab brought an act to denotify the acquired land meant for the project. It started returning back the acquired land. But this was ordered by Supreme Court to be maintained on status quo. Supreme Court in various orders has asked the center Punjab to complete the construction of the canal. But Punjab has not stopped its actions, despite several directions by the Supreme Court. So this is the problem, because it's water, it's a very emotive issue, and people are not, you know, willing to use logic, and it's a very politicized issue. Green hydrogen sector in India, why is it in the news? Because the Indian Oil Corporation, Larsen and Tubro, and Renew Power Limited have signed a binding term sheet to set up a joint venture to develop green hydrogen sector in India. If you remember, even during the budget, there was a huge amount of stress on green hydrogen. Green hydrogen is nothing but the production of hydrogen through renewable energy. That way, there is hardly any carbon that gets emitted. Over here, I have shown the uh, you know entire cycle of production of green hydrogen, its storage and its use. Okay, so please go through this uh, infograph also. India can become a hub for green hydrogen because India has a huge uh, renewable energy potential. And also producing hydrogen from renewables in India is likely to be cheaper as compared to producing it from natural gas. Steps taken for green hydrogen in India. The center has released the draft guidelines on the national hydrogen mission, which aims to increase the production to 5 million metric tons to meet about 40% of the domestic requirements of hydrogen. The center is likely to introduce a proposal uh, to introduce 15,000 crore production linked in incentive for electrolyzers. Okay, these electrolyzers are very important for electrolytic splitting of water into hydrogen and oxygen. In February, the center notified a green hydrogen and green ammonia policy that offers 25 years of free power for any new renewable energy plant set up for green hydrogen production before July 2025. Now, uh, okay, what is the process that is used for production of ammonia industrial process? It is known as Haber's process. Okay, this uses a lot of hydrogen. And if uh, the hydrogen that is being used in the Haber's process comes from green methods, then it will ensure that even fertilizer industry gets green. 
this will reduce the emissions even in the fertilizer industry and in agriculture more about hydrogen hydrogen is an alternative fuel that can be produced from diverse atomic sources it is abundant in our environment and it is stored in water hydrocarbons the most important benefit is that hydrogen can be stored moved and used to deliver energy whenever we want it and since it is abundant in nature and it has a high energy density and better combustion characteristics it has vast advantages over conventional fuels see the amount of emission produced by hydrogen is very minimalistic as compared to fossil fuels and also the calorific value of hydrogen is higher and also it in, in, it re, it results in the horsepower or it results in the thrust or push increase in vehicles as compared to when they are using non hydrogen induced uh, natural gases like say for example hcng buses okay they have a better thrust as compared to buses that are just using simple uh, natural gas types of hydrogen like what we said green hydrogen is nothing but what is produced using renewable energy and it has no carbon footprint while gray hydrogen is derived from natural gas and fossil fuels through steam methane reforming please remember this and blue hydrogen is also sourced from fossil fuels and its by products are carbon monoxide and carbon dioxide however over here it is a little better because the by products are captured and stored so it is better than gray hydrogen where the by products are not stored okay so it's the same method it is steam methane reforming this is the method that is used for production of uh, hydrogen now when it comes to electrolysis of hydrogen i'll just draw a diagram okay so you have this huge uh, drama water say okay and you have electrodes you have the cathode and you have the anode okay and this is water so water automatically gets split up into hydrogen ions and oxygen ions hydrogen has a negative charge while oxygen has a positive charge so they get respectively attracted to the cathode and the anode Okay. Now, the thing is that uh, because of the split that occurs, you get hydrogen and you get oxygen, and these would be your electrolyzers. Okay. Now, the disassociation of hydrogen and oxygen occurs when the electrodes attract ions with opposite charge to them. So, whatever is positive attracts the negative, and whatever is negative attracts the positive. and during the electrolysis an oxidation reduction reaction occurs due to the effect of electricity and uh, thanks to this you have uh, green hydrogen that is produced now the current system of production of hydrogen the current global demand of hydrogen is being produced from fossil fuels 76% is from natural gas and around 23% is from coal with the remaining from electrolysis of water okay so it is negligible as compared to i mean green hydrogen production is negligible as compared to say blue hydrogen or gray hydrogen in india hydrogen is being commercially produced in the fertilizer industry like what we said through the hayworks process petroleum refining and chemical industries also act as by product in i am sorry and also as a by product in the chloralkali industries hydrogen is produced cleaner methods of hydrogen production chiefly constitute electrolysis via chemical or photoelectric chemical routes next topic is telangana cabinet to protest outside the parliament over the procurement of paddy now what is msp it is nothing but minimum support price it is the price that is guaranteed to farmers when uh, it comes to procurement of certain crops the telangana cabinet why is it in the news because the telangana cabinet will sit on dharna outside the parliament seeking the i mean talking about the unions alleged discriminatory pad, paddy procurement the center has refused to procure paddy from telangana this rabi season reiterating that it stand that it will only purchase raw rice and not parboiled rice which the majority of the state produces in this season msp is a form of government intervention to ensure farmers against a steep decline in the prices of their goods and to help them prevent losses 
द गवर्नमेंट ऑफ इंडिया सेट्स द एम एस पी ट्वाइस अ ईयर फॉर कारिफ एंड फॉर राबी फॉर ट्वेंटी फोर कमोडिटीज दिस इज डन बाय द गवर्मेंट टू प्रोटेक्ट द फार्मर अगेंस्ट द फॉल इन द प्राइस इन द ईयर ऑफ बंपर प्रोडक्शन वेन द मार्केट प्राइस फॉल्स बिलो द डिक्लेर्ड एम एस पी द गवर्मेंट विल परचेज द एंटायर क्वांटिटी फ्रॉम द फार्मर्स एट एम एस पी दिस इज वॉट इज सेट बट द गवर्मेंट यूजली गोज फॉर प्रोक्योरमेंट ऑफ जस्ट राइस एंड वीट now these are the different items for which msp is usually announced paddy which means rice wheat jowar barley bajra ragi maize arhar or thur thur dal gram dal moong lentils urad and then amongst oil seeds most of the oil seeds are procured like say for example groundnut rape seed or mustard soya bean toria sesamum sunflower safflower niger seed apart from this there are also other commercial crops that are procured such as cotton jute copra and dhs coconut and uh, sugarcane sugarcane is procured through the fair and remunerative pricing and also tobacco now certain factors determine the prices of these products these prices are actually suggested by the Uh, commission for agricultural costs and prices which is an attached uh, body of the ministry of agriculture this uh, committee recommends the prices and it is fixed by the ccea cabinet committee on economic affairs so these are the factors on which the prices are fixed the entire structure of the economy of a particular commodity or group of commodities the cost of production that goes into it which is usually a2 plus fl or c2 change changes in the input prices input output price price parity trends in the market prices demand and supply of that commodity itself inter crop parity price effect on industrial cost structure effect on the cost of living of people effect on the general price level international price situation parity between prices paid and prices received by the farmers effect on the issue prices and implications for subsidy of the government so all these actually determine the price of commodities under msp Okay, there's a new strategic framework document for collaboration on antimicrobial resistance, which has been released by the World Health Organization in collaboration with the Food and Agricultural Organization and the World Organization for Animal Health and UNEP. So these four bodies have developed a strategic framework for fighting antimicrobial resistance, and they want to advance a One Health response. What is One Health program? One Health is when all the health of all the organisms including animals humans they are all taken under one framework and then they are designed and they are not seen in silos it's not that human health only we'll talk about or only animal health or only plant health so it's everything antimicrobial resistance is the resistance acquired by any micro organism against microbial drugs that are used to treat infections because of this resistance standard treatments become ineffective like say for example tuberculosis it has evolved into multi drug resistant tuberculosis and then further uh, evolved into extensive drug resistant tuberculosis so because of the use of multiple drugs you know the pathogens like say the bacteria or the viral viruses they have developed more immunity and they become stronger microorganisms that develop antimicrobial resistance are sometimes referred to as superbugs now what are the reasons for the spread of antimicrobial resistance first is antibiotic consumption you have more and more consumption of antibiotics which are not necessary it leads to bacterial strains and viral strains becoming more and more stronger self medication which is a problem in india in india people use medicines often and there is also over the counter purchasing of even schedule x uh, drugs schedule x are the drugs which are highly protected they are also known as red line drugs and even they are procured over the counter in medical shops access to antibiotics without prescription mass bathing in reverse also use of uh, antibiotics for growth promotion in the poultry industry by using oxytocin waste water effluence from the antibiotic manufacturing units such as pharmaceutical companies untreated uh, disposal of sewage water lack of hygiene and infection control practices in healthcare settings please remember that according to this uh, report on hand washing practices only 
31.8% of the doctors and nurses washed hands after contact with patients and hence automatically it increases i mean this antimicrobial resistance will increase okay the next news is brahmos sale to philippines the government has clarified that the brahmos sale to philippines is a bilateral sale and it does not involve russia why because russia has been getting a lot of flack for the invasion of ukraine and hence the government has made it very clear now there are some technical specifications of brahmos in this infograph please read this its maximum range is around 400 kilometers the velocity is mac 2 which means that it is a supersonic uh, missile the weight is 2 and 1/2 tons and uh, uh, its altitude that it cruises at is uh, 15 kilometers okay it cruises at a 15 kilometer altitude which is the height now uh some of the features are also given over here it is a supersonic uh, missile long flight range a uh, low radar signature radars cannot identify uh, uh, brahmos and also it has been point accuracy okay now why is it in the news while the brahmos supersonic missile was developed jointly by russia and india the sale of the systems to philippines was a bilateral deal between india and philippines itself okay there is no involvement of russia in this philippines was also given a clarification on the accidental brahmos missile launch recently there was a launch of brahmos missile into pakistan which did not explode and it was actually uh, not a technical malfunction but rather a operational malfunction and there is a committee which is introduced in order to check as to why this incident happened the first agreement for brahmos missile was signed in march of 2021 and a second agreement was signed in november and the deal was finally signed in january 2022 please remember that india's defense exports have been hugely surging okay since 2017 till 2021 india's defense exports have increased by about 6 times as compared to previously okay so which is a huge number uh six times in four years it has increased now brahmos is a frontline system in the indian defense forces and uh, the fact that india is willing to share has been appreciated by philippines why because philippines is also in the south china sea and it also has threat from chinese illegal occupation in fact china and uh, philippines contested the occupation of some islands known as the spratly islands parasal islands okay and uh, they further i'm sorry they further went to even the international court of arbitration uh, i mean sorry the permanent court of arbitration where the verdict was given in favor of philippines however china has not accepted this uh, verdict of the permanent court of arbitration on the unclos which talks about territorial sea and which talks about exclusive economic zone okay and that is why there is a bond homie between india and philippines because of this uh, chinese uh, excess activism also hindustan aeronautics limited had offered to do a technical briefing on the tejas lca aircraft uh, as there was a degree of interest on the tejas we have discussed the tejas in previous uh, classes okay it is a twin engine uh, it is a twin engine flight and it has a limited uh, flight duration of around 400 kilometers uh, you can go for mid air fuel refueling and also other things so please refer to one of the earlier classes to know more about the tejas okay one thing about brahmos is that it is based on stealth technology and that is why it is very difficult for radars uh, to find it okay and also it has an advanced guidance system okay and because of this there is a pinpointed accuracy and it operates on the fire and forget principle okay it can it operates on the fire and forget principle which means you can fire it and forget it will definitely go to the intended place also it can be launched from land air ship it can be launched from anywhere okay it is also a very heavy missile because like what we had spoken of it uh, its mass is about 2 and 1/2 tons it was jointly developed by india and russia it has an extended range of about 400 kilometers and flies at the sp- sp- speed of 2.8 mac 
okay and like what we said it can be launched from submarines from ships from aircrafts or land and it is a blending of the two rivers of brahmaputra and the moscow of russia now please see the fuel okay the fuel in the first stage you have solid rocket booster but in the second stage of the fuel you have liquid ramjet propulsion it is the ramjet propulsion that gives it supersonic speeds it is the world's fastest anti ship cruise missile currently in operation please remember this as well okay india has been trying to modify this brahmos missile and it has been giving different different types of it okay it can uh, also the good thing about it is that it is not just at 2.8 mac rather it can also be upgraded to mac 5 that way it will be a hypersonic missile so this updation is possible and this is what research has been going on on and it is very difficult to intercept this missile because of this fast speed and because of uh, its uh, anti radar technology you know it is very difficult to intercept this now one more thing is that as india has become a member of the missile technology control regime india and russia are now planning to jointly develop a new generation of brahmos missiles with 800 km range from the 400 km range we are planning to develop a brahmos missile which is 800 km range as both india earlier india was not a part of mtcr uh, uh, grouping and hence you know it, you could not collaborate with foreign countries for development of missile ranges which are more than 300 350 km but now since india is also a part of mtcr we can also collaborate with russia for the production of missiles which are in the 800 km range that's all for the day thanks